I'd like to call this markup uh, to order and uh, certainly want to welcome all the members and staff back from the Passover and Easter holiday break. And I'm sure that all of you, like me, when you uh, went home, you heard a lot from constituents about a lot of different issues. And certainly one of the, is one of the issues uh, did relate to gasoline prices. And, of course, uh, the markup today uh, is about that issue. Uh, today we're going to be marking up, considering two bills, the Strategic Energy Production Act and the Gasoline Regulation Act. Now, we don't view either of these bills as a panacea, obviously, for fixing this problem of gasoline prices. But we do believe that it is an important first step that, at least from our perspective, uh, can help improve the situation. Uh, some of us do genuinely believe that, despite the President's very good intentions of funneling a lot of stimulus money into green energy projects, uh, and which we recognize we must have in the long term, that they're really not going to do anything in the immediate term in dealing uh, with gasoline prices. So on the Gasoline Regulations Act of 2012, the legislation simply establishes a temporary interagency committee chaired by the Secretary of Energy to estimate the cumulative impacts of certain EPA rulemakings and actions on gasoline and diesel fuel prices jobs, the economy, as well as other cumulative costs and cumulative benefits, and submit a final report to the Congress of the analysis that they've developed within 210 days after enactment of the legislation. And in addition to that, we, this legislation would defer until at least six months after submission of the final report the following new regulations, number one, the Tier 3 Motor Vehicle Emission and Fuel Standards, uh, number two, the new or revised Performance Emission Standards applicable to petroleum refineries, and third, the new ozone standards. Now, some people say, well, my gosh, why are you de delaying these? Because you really don't have any idea of what's going to be in them. However, some of our hearings, we know that various interest groups have been meeting with EPA on a regular basis, and they do have some very good ideas of what they anticipate will be coming forward. And then another issue that's a little bit controversial, I recognize, is that under this uh, bill, we would require that EPA consider cost and feasibility in setting the new ozone standards. Now, of course, in the a Supreme Court case of Whitman versus American Trucking Association, the court ruled that EPA could not consider a cost or even feasibility in the setting of ozone standards. But there is a line in the court's decision in which the court, the judges wrote that the, e the uh, Clean Air Act is ambiguous a little bit on that point. So while I recognize there will be a difference of opinion, uh, we do believe that the American people have a right to have considered at least the cost and feasibility of uh, these new regulations. And then, uh, of course, the, the second bill relates to the, 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 the SPRO, uh, the Str Strategic Energy Production Act, which is introduced by Mr. Cory Gardner of Colorado. And uh, I'm not going to get into all of the details of that except to simply say that it provides that if the President decides to do a drawdown uh, from the SPRO, that the Secretary of Energy and others would have to develop a plan of how they would go about replenishing that. Uh, the last time that they drew down from the SPRO, which was in June, I guess 2011, uh, that has not been replenished yet, and of course the SPRO is for emergency use, 
and simply bringing down gasoline prices, why it's very important and means a lot to the American people, we've discovered that it does not bring down those prices for very long. So uh, I think both of these pieces of legislation are important. As I said, they're not a panacea, but uh, they're a first step, and we look forward to working uh, with both sides. I know there will be a lot of amendments, and hopefully we can come forth with something that everyone would feel at least comfortable with. So at this time, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from uh, California, uh, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes for an opening statement because it's my understanding uh, that Mr. Rush has been delayed and will not be here for a while. So, Mr. Waxman, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Today we begin marking up two bills that contain the Republican response to gasoline prices. The new Republican energy policy is talk, baby, talk, and it isn't going to lower prices at the pump by one penny. The Republicans keep saying that President Obama's policies are raising gasoline prices. Chairman Upton said so in the Republicans' weekly radio address on Saturday. And they keep uh, pointing out these bills, we lower gasoline prices. But as our mothers taught us long ago, saying something doesn't make it true. Every expert at our hearings on gas prices, including the Republicans' own witnesses, say that uh, gasoline prices are driven by the world oil prices. World oil prices have spiked with rising global demand, tensions in the Middle East, and tight supplies. Nothing in these bills will affect world oil prices. Republicans have two responses to gasoline prices at nearly $4 a gallon. First, they propose drilling for more oil. Yet every economist and oil market expert tells us that this will have no meaningful impact on world oil prices. And an example of that is just to look north to Canada. Canadians drill plenty of oil, they are energy independent, and they export to us. But this doesn't bring their prices lower. In fact, their gasoline prices go up and down in sync with ours because both are driven by world oil prices. Republicans also say they can bring down gasoline prices by blocking environmental regulations that protect Americans from dangerous air pollution. No one should be fooled by this argument. Under Republican leadership, this body has become the most anti-environment Congress in history. Since January 2011, the House Republicans have voted more than 200 times to undermine the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and other environmental laws. The premise of the legislation before us today is that high gas prices are caused by EPA regulations that haven't even been proposed. That's a complete fantasy. Americans want clean air. They don't want this committee to use high gasoline prices as an excuse for blocking regulations to reduce toxic emissions from oil refineries. Americans want cars that can go f further on a gallon of gasoline. This is especially important when fuel prices are high. They don't want us to use high gasoline prices as a pretext for blocking clean fuel regulations that the auto companies need to make cleaner, more efficient vehicles. But that is exactly what this legislation does. Even worse, one of the bills before us contains the latter amendment, a proposal that will cut the heart out of the Clean Air Act. It would overturn a unanimous 2001 Supreme Court case and repeal a 40-year-old law that says the goal of the Clean Air Act is to achieve air quality that is safe for Americans to breathe. While we can't control crude oil prices on the world market, we can act to insulate ourselves from crude oil price fluctuations, and that's exactly what the Obama administration is doing. The best way to save money at the pump is to, is to drive right by it. So the Obama administration has issued strong new rules to make vehicles more efficient. Next year's vehicles will go even further between fill-ups, as will the vehicles every year after that. The Energy Information Administration explains what this means for consumers. The costs per mile driven in 2012 were over 25 percent lower than the cost per mile in 1980, thanks to efficiency improvements. While producing more oil here won't lower gasoline prices, oil production in the U.S. is the highest it's been in eight years, and the United States has been the world's largest producer of natural gas 
since 2009. This is undisputed fact, and it shows that the Obama administration is not shutting down drilling. Instead of supporting the President's responsible initiatives, the republican control House has done everything possible to frustrate them. And House Republicans have even opposed efforts to end the billions of dollars of subsidies that the oil companies receive every year, which they don't need and the taxpayers cannot afford. If we really cared about helping the country become more resilient to gasoline price volatility, we'd be working with the administration instead of trying to block President Obama's every initiatives. These bills aren't really about lowering gasoline prices. They're, they are about using high gasoline prices as yet another nationale for advancing a profoundly anti-environment agenda. Oil companies would surely benefit if these bills are enacted, and just as surely American families will suffer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. At this time, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Gardner, who uh, is the author of the Strate Strategic Energy Production Act of 2012 for three minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on the Strategic Energy Production Act. Uh, our nation relies on abundant, affordable energy. When gas prices rise to the levels that we're seeing today, people can't afford their electricity, families have to make serious sacrifices to fill up the tank, and businesses struggle. Since being elected in November of 2010, I've held nearly 70 town meetings across the district, and the price of gas is a top concern at each and every meeting. Unfortunately, many in the administration have suggested that tapping the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is the way to bring down prices. While this may be politically expedient during a time when the President is trying to win favor with the American people, no one can argue with the fact that this is a one-time, short-term political fix to an enduring problem. Simply put, this administration has politicized the SPRO to achieve a goal that may temporarily ease prices at the pump, but will do nothing for our long-term energy security. Mr. Chairman, oil production on federal land is down. In fact, BLM under this administration has leased fewer onshore acres than any administration going back to 1984. With only 3 percent of federal land leased for oil and gas production to date, we certainly have, we, we certainly have resources at our disposal. But what perplexes me is that the federal government refuses to use these resources. The vast amounts of oil that we are unable to access will lie fallow unless we are allowed to explore them. If the administration is going to pursue short-term policies such as using the reserve for market manipulation, then shouldn't we at a minimum couple that long-term supply solution, uh, couple that with a long-term supply solution like increased domestic energy production? What's more, we have to think seriously about the threats that we have from abroad threats that could cripple our economy if our oil supply is cut off or significantly reduced. I'm for an all-of-the-above energy approach. I've said it before. I truly believe that wind, solar, hydro, and other alternative energies will play a very large role in creating stronger, more robust domestic energy supply. But reality forces the recognition that energy from these sources simply cannot, at this point, replace oil and natural gas. If we have a severe supply disruption, we should not be forced to re rely on our reserves only, but rather be able to rely on accessing domestic land for production. Mr. Chairman, the bill is simple. It does one thing. It says that if there is a problem large enough to warrant tapping into our oil reserves, reserves that are only to be used when there is a severe supply disruption, we should acknowledge that problem and put in place a long-term solution. A witness after witness has testified before this committee that increasing our domestic energy supply will have an impact, a negative impact, on the price of gasoline. I certainly am not offering my bill today in order to place any restrictions on whether the President can draw down from the SPRO. In fact, nothing in this bill prevents the President from deciding to release oil should he believe there is an emergency that warrants it. What it does say, though, is that if he is going to release oil, he should then implement a plan to increase federal land for leasing so more oil can be produced in the future. We need real solutions to the gas price problem, not quick fix politics with no long-term impact. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes, for uh, three minutes. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Uh, we're going to be marking up two bills tomorrow. I think both of them are ill-advised, but I'd like to address the Gasoline Regulations Act of 2012. Nobody's more acutely aware of gas prices than I am. I drive back and forth to my district every single day. I probably fill my car up every two days. So I see the prices uh, wherever they may be. This bill, the Gasoline 
Regulations Act of 2012 seems to be premised on the notion that if we can delay these tier three regulations that EPA is looking at and stop them from moving ahead, that that will somehow have a consequence with respect to gas prices. But the evidence does not support this. So what you have here is you have on one side the issues of smog and air pollution, on the other side this issue of gas prices. So let me speak to that quickly. A 2011 study uh, revealed that the Baltimore-Washington corridor, which encompasses much of my district, has the worst air quality on the East Coast. And moreover, the Maryland Department of Environment estimates 70 percent of the smog-forming uh, emissions affecting Maryland comes from out of state. You also have deposition of nitrogen that comes from cars, trucks, and power plants, which estimates, uh, is estimated to contribute approximately 20 percent of the nitrogen that's polluting the Chesapeake Bay. The legislation that's being proposed that we're supposed to mark up tomorrow would prevent the EPA from issuing these new tier three standards, which could reduce the sulfur. If we put these in place, it could reduce the sulfur and gasoline and thereby reduce the nitrogen oxide that's impacting air quality in my district. And it's because of that positive impact that I'd like to see those things move forward and that there be uh, no delay. The Baltimore Sun indicated a recent report by the state air quality regulators showed that the cost of the new Tier 3 standards would be about a penny per gallon at the pump versus $234 million to upwards of $1.2 billion that it could save in fewer hospitalizations, fewer sick days, and fewer premature deaths. And that didn't even account for the economic benefits uh, from the Chesapeake Bay in terms of cleaner uh, water quality. So my concern here is I think the majority is attempting really to dismantle the Clean uh, Air Act protections with negative consequences for people in my district and across the country and to do so in the name of reducing gasoline prices when in fact that's not what would happen. All this legislation would do is create dirtier air for my constituents and others and for that reason I oppose it and I yield back my time. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this time, I recognize the full committee chairman, Mr. Upton of Michigan, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Many factors impact the price of gas, including the global events that are not easily controlled by Congress for sure. But some factors are squarely within our control, and we owe it to the American people to do something about them. This includes increasing domestic oil production and cutting red tape. And that is precisely what the Strategic Energy Production Act and the Gasoline <coughs> Regulations Act will help accomplish. The President, as we know, is considering another drawdown of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in an attempt to bring down prices. <clears throat> and as, long, as a longtime proponent of the SBR as an insurance policy against major disruptions in oil supplies, I am very leery of drawing down the reserve in a non-emergency situation. The reserves are currently at 696 million barrels, which gives us roughly 80 days of protection from a major disruption of imports. It is already 30 million barrels lower than last year when the President tapped it in a failed attempt to reduce prices. Now the President may draw it down again. Fortunately, there is a supply of domestic oil that could prove <clears throat> to be orders of magnitude. Fortunately, there is a supply of domestic oil that could prove to be orders of magnitude greater than the entire SPR, and that's the oil beneath federal lands in offshore areas that are currently off limits. Despite administration assertions to the contrary, the President continues to keep nearly all of this oil out of reach and has slowed the pace of new energy leasing on the federal estate. The Strategic Energy Production Act requires that any future drawdown of the SBR must be accompanied by new federal oil leases. I would like to thank my friend and colleague Cory Gardner of Colorado for his sponsorship of this common sense measure. Energy rich states like Colorado want, a, want to be a bigger contributor to the nation's affordable energy needs and creating thousands of high-paying energy industrial jobs in the process. Not a bad thing. 
but federal reluctance to issue energy leases often stands in the way. The Strategic Energy Production Act helps eliminate that roadblock for Colorado as well as other inland and coastal states that want to be a part of the solution by producing more domestic oil. The price at the pump is also affected by the cost of refining oil into gas and diesel fuel. EPA's regs are a part of those costs. I would note that the President's January 2011 Executive Order Improving Regulation and Regulatory Review said all the right things about the need for agencies to rein in the costs of red tape, including the costs of cumulative regulations. Gasoline regs would be a great starting point for implementing this very executive order, but the Obama EBA has yet to turn its words into action. Indeed, rather than consider streamlining existing gas regs, the agency is about to embark on a potentially costly wave of new ones. Get the Gasoline Regulations Act requires that the cumulative impact of these upcoming rules have to be analyzed before they go into effect. This includes EPA's costly global warming agenda as well as the Tier 3 gasoline regs that may impact future prices at the pump. And given the recent announcements of several re refinery closures, a 2011 DOE finding that regulations played a role in 66 refinery closures since 1990, the study would also look at the impact of new regs on jobs in domestic refining capacity. I'd like to thank my friend and colleague, our subcommittee chair, Mr. Whitfield, for still taking time off from celebrating the Wildcats National Championship and sponsoring this very sensible bill. You've done your homework, and we appreciate that. I yield back the balance of my time. Well, thank you, Mr. Upton. I, uh, that means a lot to me. <laughs> This time, I'd like to uh, recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Olson, for three minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for bringing these important pieces of legislation before this subcommittee. The Gasoline Regulations Act of 2012 and the Strategic Energy Production Act of 2012 represent our commitment to reduce the price of energy, create jobs, grow our economy, and protect our national security. We must continue to the necessary steps to reel in the President's anti-American energy agenda. Most Americans agree that the President's approach will not strengthen our economy and lift us out of this recession. The Obama White House is delaying the Keystone XL pipeline, wasting billions on loan guarantees for political gain, slow walking permits for drilling on federal lands, picking winners and losers by proposing subsidies for green energy and higher taxes for small businesses, and toying with the idea of tapping our strategic petroleum reserve. These two bills before us today are truly common sense measures that can get us back on track. Chairman Whitfield's bill would simply require EPA to estimate the cumulative impact of rulemaking on fuel prices, jobs, and the environment. And Mr. Gardner's bill would simply require the Secretary of Energy to develop a plan to replace fuel depleted by a drawdown of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. How can you argue with that? In my opinion, the federal government should have been doing this all along. This committee has passed bill after bill to stabilize energy prices, create thousands of good jobs, and enhance our national security through energy independence for America. It's time the Senate votes on them and sends them to the President to be signed. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Olson. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise, for a three-minute opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, our, our friends in the city of New Orleans, we're happy to welcome uh, all the Kentucky fans down to New Orleans for the Final Four and congratulate you on the, uh, the victory you went home with. I uh, want to commend you as well, Mr. Chairman, for bringing these two bills uh, to the committee and to, to ultimately hopefully bring these to the House floor and continue uh, this debate on energy. And, you know, those of us who support an all-of-the-above energy strategy know uh, that the Gasoline Regulations Act that Chairman Whitfield brought forward uh, would start to at least put some sunshine and, and hopefully rein in some of the radical regulations that are coming out of the EPA. Uh, you know, it seems too often now, and, you know, the last two weeks we're back home in our districts, uh, I was talking to small businesses all throughout my district, and 
Every time you talk to small business owners and our job creators across this country, I ask them, what are the things that are holding you back from creating more jobs? What kinds of things can you see that would allow you to create more jobs? And time and time again, they say the regulations coming out of Washington, D.C. are the things that are holding them back the most. And unfortunately, the EPA is the biggest offender that they cite. And so I applaud the chairman for bringing this bill that will shed light on the costs associated with all of these radical regulations that have nothing to do with clean water or clean air. It has to do with pursuing an agenda that wants to shut down fossil fuels and shut down the ability of our country uh, to manufacture goods. And it's already led to millions of jobs leaving our country, and that's one of the reasons so many people are unemployed today that are trying to find work. Um, my, uh, my colleague, Mr. Gordon, Gardner, for, uh, I want to commend him as well for bringing the Strategic Energy Production Act uh, to finally put some checks and balances on the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Uh, we've seen all too often that President Obama has used the tr Strategic Petroleum Reserve as a bailout fund for his failed policies. That's not why it's there. In fact, just last year when the President rated the fund to the total of 30 million barrels of oil that still he has not replaced. He said it was going to slow down the increase in price of gasoline. It didn't do anything to, to slow down the increase of price in gasoline. Prices were back up above where they were uh, just, a year, uh, just a week before he did that. And so, you know, for the president to go and raid this fund every time he has failed policies and the public uh, gets irate about the price they're paying, uh, you know, just go take a look at, at the price at the pump where it was when the president took office, $1.83, and where it is today, about $3.90 and in, in rising. And, and it's because of his failed policies. And when he says that he's for all of the above, unfortunately, his policies contradict those very statements. If you look at President Obama's own U.S. Energy Information Administration, this is the Obama administration, estimates that oil production in the Gulf of Mexico alone was down 22 percent last year. And it's projected to be down 30% in 2012 with respect to production forecasts. It's because of the president's own policies. And so he goes running around saying production's never been higher because on private lands where he's trying to shut down through the EPA hydraulic fracturing, it's been up. But where he has control on federal lands, it's actually down, and according to his own administration, by more than 30% this year in the Gulf of Mexico alone. It's killing jobs. It's raising the cost of gasoline. It's time we rein that in, and I applaud you for bringing these bills, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Scalise, and I want to thank uh, all of you members who came back in time to give your opening statements. And, of course, uh, all members' opening statements will be made part of the record pursuant to committee rules. And if there are no further opening statements, uh, the chair would now call up the Gasoline Regulations Act of 2012 and ask the clerk to report. A discussion draft to require analysis of the cumulative impacts of certain rules and actions of the Environmental Protection Agency that impact gasoline and diesel fuel prices, jobs, and the economy, and for other purposes. Without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with, and the bill will be open for amendment at any point. So ordered. For the information of members, we are now on the Gasoline Regulations Act of 2012, the subcommittee will reconvene at 10 a.m. tomorrow, and I would remind members that the chair will give priority recognition to amendments offered on a bipartisan basis. So I look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow, and the subcommittee stands in recess.